UALR Television is pleased to bring you the Clinton School Speaker Series. The simple pursuit of creativity is a triumphant act. Every decision we make with our money has an impact. The black athlete is the most important, the most influential, the most visible black employee this country's ever produced. With the experience of the past, we need to do more. We need to find ways to build local capacity, to help train people to solve local problems, and provide life-saving services to those in need. We all share a human capacity for endurance, determination, and resilience. Throughout the year, the Clinton School of Public Service hosts national and international leaders and public figures. Here's tonight's speaker. So proud to be here to kick off the first lecture of this in this downtown space. We've partnered with the Clinton School. Thank you, Dean Rutherford. This is an amazing first event. Um, I do want to thank one person in particular before I hand it over, and that's Senator Joyce Elliott, who's agreed to moderate this evening's panel discussion. And really, you don't need to hear from the Chancellor here, <laughs> except I'm incredibly proud of day one of our downtown space. So with that, there's a very short video just to kind of set the stage for what Joe Jones' mural is all about, and then we'll hand it over to Senator Elliott. 1984, Bobby Roberts got a phone call about this painting that had been discovered in a house in western Arkansas and they said you might be interested because it was a mural that had been painted at the Commonwealth College. I said how much do they want for it? He said $500 and so I said I'll be out there with a truck to get it because I knew a little bit about Commonwealth College and I knew a little bit about uh, Joe Jones although I had never heard of the mural. The art was painted as a piece of protest art so what it dealt with what Joe Jones saw in Arkansas he's from Missouri what he saw in Arkansas and this is in 1930 what it would be known for is lynchings cotton picking and union busting. And so that's the, that's the theme of the painting and it graphically shows all of that going on. It's a miracle to me that it survived because it had been cut up as a liner in a clothes closet. In 2009, I got a phone call from the St. Louis Art Museum. Uh, Andrew Walker was the curator there and he was doing a major retrospective of Joe Jones. And he said, we think you might have a mural painted by Joe Jones and they agreed to conserve a central portion of the mural for the exhibit in St. Louis. Once you had one of the four by eight panels restored and people saw it, they realized what a magnificent piece of art it really was. It is a very provocative mural. It's very thoughtful. When you look at the compelling imagery that Joe Jones painted, I mean, he was depicting the struggles many people faced in the 1930s in America. There's this great quote. He says, I don't want to paint pretty pictures that match pink and blue walls. I want to paint pictures that punch holes in walls. When I first saw it, I was just stuck on that first frame and almost couldn't move. And as I did, uh, it makes you slow your life down. It makes you think. It gives me the chills. <laughs> I have the chills right now. Um, thinking about that mural and coming from southeastern Arkansas, it hits home. It has this sense of being alive. It um, disturbs and it heals. It's a graphic piece of art, but it's part of our history. It causes people to think, it causes people to comment, it causes people to gather. I can see that, that mural being that spark and, and the creation of several conversations, not just one. We only learn about who we are if we recognize, acknowledge, and learn from our history. And that's what we're trying to do. It's a great place for this piece of art to reside because it'll be very accessible for the public. Yeah, it's worth an applause. <laughs> well, welcome everybody and thank you so much for being here this evening. You will forgive me if I'm a bit exuberant to be here because the legislative session has begun, so it's always nice to end the day doing something like this. Uh, and, and this is, is pretty special, and, and thank you um, for all making the time to be here today. Um, this is all about in, uh, introducing the struggle in the South through this mural, and I want to thank Chancellor Rogerson and um, thank all the people, including, excluding myself, 
who participated in putting this video together. And it is my pleasure to introduce to you now the folks who are going to be on our panel tonight to talk about this. But as much as anything else, though, I do want to say how special it is to have this UA Little Rock space downtown. Don't you think that's great? It is just fantastic. Already, I've, I've worn out my welcome here, I suspect, because I've been down here so much. Well, let's get on with introducing the panelists. Um, Brad Cushman, just raise your hands so everybody know who you are. Brad Cushman is a studio artist and UA Little Rock's gallery director and curator for nearly 20 years. He's the voice of Picture This on KUAR, our local NPR station. I've heard him so many times. And the host of Inside Art, which is a television program on the UA Little Rock's University TV. Uh, the next person is uh, Dr. Guy Lancaster. Dr. Guy Lan uh, Lancaster is an adjunct professor at the University of Arkansas Clinton School of Public Service and editor uh, of the Butler Center's online encyclopedia of Arkansas history and culture. That is a special resource. Thank you for that. His books about our state's race relations have won Book Award and Literary Prize, the J.G. Ragsdale Book Award, and the John Williams Graves Book Award. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Lancaster. Dr. Brian Mitchell. Dr. Uh, Mitchell is a professor of African American history at UA Little Rock and an associate faculty, faculty member at the university's Anderson Race and Ethnicity Institute. He has devoted much of his career to uncovering the mysteries of the 1919 Elaine Massacre, one of the deadliest race riots in US history. Dr. Bobby Roberts, that we all just call Bobby, but I'm being nice tonight. <laughs> Dr. Bobby Roberts served as the director of the Central Arkansas Library System from 1989 until his retirement in 2016. He's a former faculty member of the University of Arkansas at Fayetteville and a UA Little Rock, uh, and UA Little Rock specializing in military history. Um, he is the co-author of four books about the Civil War as well as numerous articles and book chapters. And uh, Tamora Williams, y'all can guess who she is, um, <laughs> is a senior at UA Little Rock and, the fourth, and a fourth year Donaghy Scholar. This spring, she will receive her Bachelor's of Arts Business Manage in Business Management, Innovation and Entrepreneurship with a minor in Nonprofit Leadership Studies Programs. That's a lot, Tamora. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> So as many of you know, in 1935, the famed American artist, Joe Jones, created the struggle in the South. This provocative artwork includes images of Southern sharecroppers, coal miners, and a black family in fear of a lynching. It was originally painted in the dining hall at the Commonwealth College near Mena, much of what was said on the video, in Mena, Arkansas. Recently, however, this 44 by 9 foot mural was restored with a 500,000 grant from Arkansas Natural and Cultural Resources Center. And that was something that, and, that, and I want to thank uh, Heritage uh, for, uh, our Heritage Department for that grant because without that money, this, we could very well not be discussing this mural tonight. And so I just want to give a shout out to everybody who's not on the stage tonight who helped to make sure that this, this came to fruition. Mm -hmm. And uh, we discussed a lot about this mural. Those of us who were uh, brought in to take a look at it and to see what do you think? Is this something we ought to, we ought to have and do? Should, and should we make sure it's the centerpiece from downtown? And we all said yes, because this is who we are. And, and for some people, it might be a little disconcerting, but we ought to be disconcerted. Because, and we can never change who and what we are that could be better as you can't, you can't fix it until you face it. And that's what this mural does for a lot of us. But more than that, I think it's a piece of art that is gonna be a centerpiece for downtown that will help us branch out to look at other pieces of art around this state. The Arkansas legislature, I will tell you for the first time, um, we have formed uh, a legislative art caucus. And it's, it's yes. We have formed a legislative art caucus that focuses on art and the economy. And so we've been working with our Kansans for the Arts. I think Garbo is here tonight. She's been integral to that. 
And I know at least one of our uh, caucus members is here. I know that Matt Pitch is here. Matt, will you raise your hand? Yeah, so thank you so much for that. We really appreciate that. So let's get on with the questions. And I, I'm starting, I guess, with, with um, you, Brad. This mural disappeared for nearly 40 years and somehow it had another life. How did it disappear and what happened as a result of that and it getting back to us? Thank you for being here, everyone. Uh -huh. Thank you, Joyce. Um, Bobby, you changed my life <laughs> in 1984 because Bobby's the one that got the call to purchase the mural. But where did it go? In 1940, five years after it had been painted, the college shut down. So property was auctioned off, buildings were torn down, and the mural disappeared. It was in 1983 that um, a house in Mina, uh, a woman discovered a face appearing from under some wallpaper in a closet. And it wasn't just one closet, it was two closets. Um, we've, dis we've discerned that in our research. And she called in some antique dealers that she knew in the area and they took crowbars and they began to extract it from the house. So it was basically under the bed in a closet basically. Yeah. For, and it was painted over, wallpapered over, turned face in, the imagery was not important. We know that by the direction of the nail holes from when it was taken out and then turned around and nailed up. And so, yeah, it was basically hidden in a closet. Well, in Mena, Arkansas. In Amazing. Mena. Uh -oh. On Magnolia Street. <laughs> <laughs> that makes it ever so Southern, doesn't it? Uh, Bobby, um, when, you, when you got the call and somebody said to you they would sell it, what was it, $500 or whatever it was? You know, it is very true on a lot of levels, you get what you pay for. Um, <laughs> what were you thinking that, were you optimistic it was really gonna be something important considering it had such a, it had such a small price on it? Something in you, of course, I guess the history you knew or whatever, but will you share with us sure. what made you think this is something I have to do? Sure, the, the person that called me about it was a man named Fajo Cravens. And Fajo was a retired banker in Fort Smith, an old Fort Smith family. He had, I think, a grandfather, maybe his father had been a congress. And Fajo, over the years, had just collected anything he could get on Western Arkansas. Uh, I was running the manuscript collection at UALR. We were trying to build that collection up. We didn't have anything. And one of the three collections I thought we needed to get to really establish the, the place was to get Fajo Cravens to sell us his material, uh, which he did. And he was a great collector. He knew what he was looking at and knew what was going to be valuable to historians. I hadn't seen Fajo and heard from him in two or three years. And I just got a call from him out of the blue. And he said, there's this mural up here that was in Commonwealth College. And you might want to get this thing. Uh, I had never seen it. I knew a little bit about Commonwealth College because I, when I worked at the University of Arkansas Special Collections, I used some of the papers. I was aware of what it was and the importance of it. And I thought, I said, well, they want for it. He said, $500. I said, well, let me, let me get the 500 bucks. I'll get a truck and we'll go up there and get it. Uh, and I got it because I trusted Fajo. I didn't think he would uh, mislead me on anything like that. Would so you he spell was, his name? Is that his, yeah, is that his it's, real it's a, name? Yeah, it, yeah it, <laughs> okay. it's F-A-D-J-O. Okay. And uh, okay. he really was one of those collectors in Arkansas that had an eye for manuscripts and photographs and, and was a great talker and could just wheedle people out of their belongings and <laughs> take them in there. We, we bought them. A lot of people in Fort Smith, I think, probably didn't like UALR for about 20 or 30 years of that purchase. But anyway, when he told me that I went out there to get them, uh, as Brad said, they, they had been cut up. They were just stacked up in a pile. Uh, we put them in the truck, took them back, put them out on the, I didn't even know what the subject matter was. We put them out on the floor and you could see what you're gonna see later. And uh, they were very rough form. They had, as you said, had, some of them had wallpaper on them. Some of the paint was flaking off on them. They'd obviously not been taken care of. Uh, but I looked at them. I'm not an artist. I'm, and I'm not even allowed to pick paint at home when we're doing anything. So I'm not, I'm not an art critic. But I did understand that it would have some historic value in the story that it was telling and the interpretation that you would be getting from someone who went to a, to a place like Commonwealth College, what it said about what they thought about Arkansas in the 30s. So I thought as a historic piece, it was important. Uh, then we transferred it to the art uh, department. They didn't know what to do with it. Uh, I'd, every once in a while I'd go over and say, why don't we get that out and get a committee and see if we can raise some money. And they'd, 
like the university likes to do, they'd appoint about 25 people to the committee and nothing would happen, you know, and it'd just kind of disappear. Uh, and uh, I was delighted when, when, uh, when Brad got interested in it and when uh, a group in St. Louis was doing a show on Jones, wanted to show one of those panels off. And when I saw it, when it was done, when it had been restored, I was astounded at, at what a wonderful piece of, yeah. of art it is. So you're going to enjoy it when you see it. Yeah. And that's the end of my story. That's all I had to do with it. <laughs> he said, don't ask me any more questions. That's what I know. That's what I know. Yeah, so, so Brad, um, I, I guess either one of you. Let me ask, the, the audience will determine whether or not I ask this question. How many of you know what the Commonwealth School was? Raise your hands if you do. So a whole bunch of people don't. So between the two of you, will you just give us a quick, can, what you know about the Commonwealth School? Because I didn't know about it, and I really found it pretty arresting to hear about it. So which of one of you no wants to do it? I did, Brad. I, I Tell us what you know, Brad. Well, and they what, know less than you do, so What I know good. is that yeah. it started in Louisiana, if my research is correct, and then there was a schism, and then a group moved up to Western Arkansas, they for a while were in Inc, Arkansas, and then they moved into Mena, and then eventually found the property outside of Mena where it's now a, a horse farm, um, and um, there are about four buildings that still exist from the college. Um, but their interests were, so that's 1923, 24, and it was in existence till 1940. Um, and their interest was the proletariat cause, labor issues, and um, I know one person who has a relative locally that went there, Bettina Brownstein's family wow. attended the Commonwealth College. And so that well, was that our- that explains Bettina. Yeah. <laughs> so were there a lot of Arkansans attending Commonwealth College? Yeah. No. Yeah. They were coming down from Illinois, mm -hmm. Ohio, various places. Now that didn't mean there weren't Arkansas uh, students, but um, they were traveling and Mina is a remote place even to this day. I know, I've been there many times. Yeah. So I can't imagine in 1935, they started out with tents. Mm -hmm. I've seen photographs of tent campus and then they eventually built buildings. And when we say it's in the Commonwealth College dining hall, mm -hmm. it's a farmhouse yeah. with a dining room and an alcove. So the mural wrapped around this alcove. So it's different than when we think of campuses today. Well, but, I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, let, let's just hold on, wait, because we're so going to have So I'm going to defer because some yeah. of the historians probably have more they probably eloquent have more information. Well, we are uh, going to have some time for questions about later on. The college. Yeah. Um, but that's my, and then they invited Joe Jones. I will tell you this bit because Joe Jones, how did he get on the radar? He was a St. Louis painter. Mm -hmm. And so in 1933, 34, he was working in the abandoned courthouse in St. Louis where they'd auctioned slaves on the steps. The Dred Scott decision had been made, but it was now abandoned, so a group of artists were using the courtrooms as studios. He was teaching out-of-work laborers, black and white together, the art of mural painting. And he did a mural with them called Social Unrest. And one day he showed up to his studio and there was a padlock on the door. And they said, you're teaching more politics than poetics and aesthetics and art. And so he was kicked out. That gave him a national spotlight, and magazines like The New Masses and other places covered that. And I think that's one of the reasons why he ended up at Commonwealth, because I said, this is a working man's artist. This is who we want in Arkansas to tell this story. See, that's what happened. Brad gets wound up, says he doesn't know anything. He tells you everything. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Brad. Now I'm going to go on now to Guy and Brian. Uh, I'll, I'll give you both these questions at one time in the interest of trying to have more time for the audience to participate. But uh, one, the first question has to do with if, if uh, one of you will give us the cultural context around this mural and the importance of these scenes that people are going to see. Um, so you can divide it however you wish to, you're grown men. Uh, the, the, se <laughs> the second question is, um, um, why it, this, is this an important depiction of Arkansas history? Uh, if you'll just talk to us around those two concepts, anything else you want to add, uh, appreciate it. Okay. First, we have to understand that uh, the mural was painted in 35. Mm -hmm. um, some of the uh, events that are captured in the mural, however, uh, 
can be seen throughout the decade or so mm -hmm. um, around the time that the school was opened. Uh, there's racial violence, and he, Jones sees racial violence as critical to supporting the infrastructure of sharecropping. And there could not be violence, there could not be sharecropping without violence and intimidation mm -hmm. um, to support it. Uh, he also sees an exploitation on the, on the part of white workers, and these are miners, and he uses the example of miners. And it's funny because he borrows this, he uses, reuses this in other uh, murals that he's done. So he's not talking about just the miners that are in Arkansas, but he's also looking at miners uh, in Appalachia, and he's, he's talking about miners throughout the nation mm -hmm. when he does mm -hmm. this. Yeah. Oh, I, I was going to say the, the uh, centerpiece, of course, is that image of, of the lynching. It, it almost functions like a triptych, you know, with, with the, the lynched Christ at the center, if you would. And from 1836 to 1936, there were 360 plus lynchings in Arkansas, including one in Mena in 1909. Uh, so, you know, the lynching was still going on while, while this painting was being done. But I, I think he places it at the center among those other two images, the, the coal mining and the, and the sharecropping, to sort of interrogate how we define violence. Um, you know, if, if we were to, to define violence as, as any action that results in a, in a uh, m injury or maldevelopment or death, we, we expand our definition. Uh, we, we have to s see so much more of our, our shared universe as, as violent. If, if you're starving to death, it doesn't matter whether you're starving because some dictator is denying you food or because mm -hmm. the economic system makes food unaffordable for you and your family. Uh, if you're drinking poisoned water, it doesn't matter if some terrorist dumped it in the water system or if the city council voted to get it from a poisoned river. So what he's doing is, is expanding our definition of violence and expanding uh, our, our critique of institutions. Well, I, I want that depiction, the other question about how, why is this depiction important to Arkansas today? So maybe to paraphrase that for both of us, for both of you to think about, why should people care about this to, today, and how does it inform our lives today? You see a nexus here from then to now. Well, we're coming up on the 100th anniversary of the Elaine Race Riot. Um, the Elaine Race Riot is believed to have been one of the largest acts of mass violence in the nation, and this serves as not only a reminder of that legacy that we've had, of that connection that we had, but it also a reminder of the exploitation and what happens when people don't stand up to corruption, don't stand up uh, to exploitation. Um, it's a reminder of when our courts fail to serve justice, uh, when we fail as citizens to come to our neighbor's aid. So I think it, it does have some valuable reminders for people uh, today. Any well, thought on that guy? Go ahead. Well, I, I, absolutely, and I, I've sort of had a meditation upon a recent experience. I, I dislocated my jaw a while back and you know, had to take medicine and, and undergo physical therapy to, to get it to where I could eat an apple again. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, part of, part of therapy, part of becoming functional again is a, diagnosing your injury, and then B, taking corrective measures. Well, what historians do, we, we diagnose these injuries. What artists do is, is identify them. And uh, we as a society, we've undergone social trauma, like physical trauma that you'd have to recover from for therapy. But we're, we've done a very poor job of uh, actually undergoing the therapy to recover from social trauma. Uh, so I think, I think it's very important to have something like this as uh, a first step uh, in that process. All right, thank uh, you, thank you. Uh, go ahead, go yeah, ahead, Brian. I also want to, to make note that we often romanticize the past. Mm -hmm. uh, we romanticize how good things were in the past. 
Um, mm -hmm. uh, we could comment a lot about making America great again, but we romanticize <laughs> uh, what it was like in the past. And, and this reminds us that our understanding of the past is a matter of per perspective and experience. Yeah. That one person's wonderful past mm -hmm. could have been someone else's help. Every time, I know every time somebody tells me about the good old days, I go, <laughs> what, when was that? Um, where were your good old days? Yeah, I was, uh, I, I, hold on one okay. second. I'm just gonna ask you to make it real brief because I gotta get to 10 more, but go yeah. right go right ahead. Brother. I just, uh, for the historians, Joe Jones, and for all of you, when you look at the mural, he wanted it read right to left. left. And, and that starts with the coal mining. So, um, and we can come back to that, but that's, something that he said he wanted. So that's an interesting discussion in itself. But yeah, I do want to come back to that if we get a chance. Yeah. I would like that. Uh, but we have a student on the panel. I want to be sure we hear from her. So Tamora, um, how do you feel about uh, UA Little Rock opening this facility with such a prominent, provocative mural? And how is it key to this space, do you think? So I feel proud that we would open a space and have this um, as the focal point and I feel that way for different reasons there are some very personal reasons just as I've learned um, more about my own history um, but also about Arkansas so I'm not a native of Arkansas I am actually from the Northwest and coming here was the first time I really had to encounter and grapple with racism and so I think a statement like that should shake you to your core, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, I also believe that if we're discussing history um, and defining ourselves and our identity, the importance of history is not just in understanding where we've come from, but who we are now. Your history is not something that you just leave behind. It permeates everything that has to deal with who you are today. Um, also, just in central Arkansas, um, with the racial demographics that we have here, um, we need to understand that if we really know the power of education, of reaching out and making sure that people have the opportunity um, to experience the blessings I have, then we need to be able to meet them in any trauma, a mental that they may be coming from in the things that may have prevented their ancestors or those before them from having experienced this. So I have friends that I know who are the first in their family to graduate from high school. Um, but that doesn't come from just laziness. That comes from a history. And so one way to explain this and I think kind of encapsulate this is I went on a mission trip with an on-campus ministry I'm with and we were able to go this past spring break to Holly Grove in New Orleans. So it's a borough in New Orleans. And I have had various discussions in classrooms academically. I'm a Donaghy scholar, so we discuss these issues all of the time about race and the struggles with that and even your own personal identity. But I did not understand its reality until this trip. Um, the first day we drove around a neighborhood and we went from Holly Grove across a bridge and we were in this affluent neighborhood with these large houses. And when you cross back over the bridge, you find just a state of living that is not the same. Um, we also saw the difference between green infrastructure, and I'll explain why I'm saying this, green infrastructure and gray infrastructure. And so if we know anything about um, New Orleans and their history with flooding and all of these things. Great infrastructure is the use of cement concrete um, to force water in a certain direction, whereas green infrastructure uses plants and things like that to capture it and mm -hmm. feed the local flora. So you see how the use of great infrastructure has led to this water being forced into this one side of the neighborhood that is already suffering. And wouldn't you know that most of that neighborhood is African American. Mm -hmm. So where is the protection? Where is someone who's speaking out against this? So the point of having this in our facility, in our building, is to understand that it's not just about 
talking about it and then going home and leaving it here. This is at the heart of our university. So it needs to be at the heart of us. And we have to stand up and begin to fight for and discuss these things and live them as our reality because it is our reality. That's a great response. Thank you so much, Tamar. It's a great response. Um, and, and we are, Nikolai has given me the high sign for his time for, for uh, questions from the audience. He's also going to give me a high sign when it's time to stop. And if you're in the <laughs> middle of your sentence, you're going to stop. All right? So uh, why don't we do this? If you have a question, please don't make a statement just in the interest of everybody. So wherever the first question is. Uh, so there's a mic here and a mic over here. So who has a question? Nobody. OK, all right. Uh, wait, wait for the mic, because we're, we're recording this. Part of the WPA. Was this part of the WPA? Yeah, Go was, ahead, Brad. It was uh, the college raised money. They tried to raise fifty dollars. They got twenty, and <laughs> Joe Jones built a bonfire to create his own charcoal. So, um, no, it was not funded by the federal government. Well, and, and Commonwealth College was a radical socialist institution, and yeah. it would, wouldn't have received any federal funds. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, that is what got my attention so much. It was a radical socialist. Institution in Mena, Arkansas? Yeah. Just in Arkansas, yeah. period. Where's the next question? Right there. Okay. Nobody has yet mentioned the young man from, from Huntsville who went to that college. Did, okay. Would somebody comment yeah. on that? Oh, I follow you. Okay. Yeah, I, yeah. the most famous student was Orville Fallis. Yes. Or, yeah. Yes. Uh, <laughs> that issue came up, I guess, in the cherry race. Yeah, isn't that right, Cherry? Yeah. He said, well, I never went up there. I didn't, you know, it's just a big story that was concocted. And then slowly he's kind of like, well, I went up there, but I only stayed about two weeks. And, you know, well, actually, I, you know, I was president of the student body or something. I mean, he, was, he, he, had, he had quite an impact. I'd love to know what he thought about the mural, wouldn't you? That'd be interesting to find anything what he thought. But, yeah, he, he's the most famous, unfortunately, um, uh, alumni, quite kind of alumni of Commonwealth. The teachings didn't stick. <laughs> <laughs> what did you add to it, Brian? The teachings of oh. the university didn't stick, I uh, guess. Oh, <laughs> yeah, probably not. No, that's okay, next question. I need to stop not saying it. There's a, you have one right here, and then we'll have, you have one on that side yet, then we'll tap you next, okay? Hi, yes, I was wondering, uh, do you have any sense of how the locals in MENA received this college and what their reaction was, if they kind of understood what it was they were doing there and uh, the different outsiders that they were attracting. I, I grew up uh, in Mena, Arkansas. I live in Little Rock and work for a labor union, so I feel particularly connected <laughs> uh, to this discussion, so I would appreciate your, uh, your response. All okay. right. They were not well loved. <laughs> uh, we can tell from a series of newspaper articles that were run, um, they were constantly seen as un-American. They were brought up on charges mm -hmm. of un-American, uh, being un-American and, and being communist. They tried to close the school a number of times. Uh, in fact, there was one big scare when uh, the manager of the school, Lucian Koch, he didn't come back from a trip in a timely manner and they thought he was kidnapped and killed or possibly oh lynched. Um, and then they personally attacked Koch, and Koch would end up leaving, uh, leaving the college and, and going back to the East. All right, thank you. Next question is right here. Where's the microphone? Uh, is that correct? Oh, uh, no, no, we have to have the microphone because we're recording, but that we're going to get what she'll give it to you next. I'm sorry about that. Whoever has it. The uh, style of the uh, painting reminds me a lot of Thomas Hart Benton. Uh, could you uh, comment on the relationship maybe between Benton's style and the style of Mr. Jones? The um, magazine I mentioned earlier, The New Masses, uh, uh, Benton and Jones actually wrote letters publicly back and forth to one another about what they thought regionalism was. Um, and I think there's a lot of similarities in their style. There's a mural at um, the Metropolitan Museum of Art that was painted at the New School in the 30s, and there's a segment of the South. And you, when you look at that, the stylization of the figure that Benton did is similar to Jones. So they certainly knew each other. They exchanged ideas about art, and um, I, that's a short, quick answer. Okay, that's good. <laughs> 
next question right here with this, this gentleman. Give him that microphone. Uh, is such art being made in Arkansas today? Okay. Did you hear that question? Is such it's art being made in Arkansas today to depict these kinds of things? I don't know. I haven't seen very many murals mm -hmm. that are of a similar content and mm -hmm. similar nature, but I mean, we do have lots of artists here, and I'm, I'm sure that there are some people who are inspired by the work of Jones. And there, and there is protest art being made. I, I, I see it in the communities, um, and they'll have exhibits. Uh, last year, we hosted an example on campus, Nasty Women. Well, that comment came from a political discourse, and then a number of women in the state responded um, their thoughts about that. So it might not be directly related to the subject matter in the mural, but there are artists out there voicing their opinions about the world, and often their voices are in protest. Okay, Maura, did you want to comment on that? Yes, thank Please. you. Um, I believe exactly what you're saying. We're, I believe we're seeing more of a trend where um, it may not necessarily specifically be racial violence, but it's a social violence that we're seeing people speak out against and do their best to depict the emotional intensity of it as well as how it permeates our culture. So it's, it's a much deeper approach. But I believe there is also a trend in terms of the racial issues we may have where there's a looking back to past the times when what we know of um, African history or African American history is one of just pain, but also the celebration of the origins and roots. So you see more of that maybe coming into um, the dialogue, I suppose. Okay, thank you. Is there another question? Okay. Go ahead. Having been down to Mena many, many times uh, <laughs> and not seen very many African Americans there, and having been a uh, football player of the years, the schools were closed in Little Rock by Orville Fulvis. Mm -hmm. My mother said I couldn't be a semi-pro football, <laughs> high school football player and sent me off to live with an aunt out of state. I am very curious about the artist's ability to perceive and portray uh, the African-American experience at that time, not just in our state's history, but elsewhere. And I was shocked to see that it was such a part of the MENA mural. Mm -hmm. Me too. Yes. If you could comment on that. Yeah. Well, one of the things that's fascinating about uh, the students, uh, the teaching at the school is uh, students that attended the school actually did not pay a tuition. They worked uh, 20 hours. They were obligated to work 20 hours per week uh, toward the school. Uh, they also traveled around the country and around the state uh, to areas so they could do grassroots work mm -hmm. in communities. So uh, many of these students would have experienced what sharecropping was like uh, firsthand. They would have stayed in sharecroppers' houses and visited sharecropping communities and heard the concerns of, of uh, black farmers. And it, it, it's funny that you bring up the lack of blacks mm -hmm. in the county because that will be the straw that breaks the back uh, and what ultimately closes the school is when the students demand that black students should be allowed to attend the school and you would assume that you know communism or uh, socialist socialist connections would have been the thing that closed the school down the thing that people couldn't tolerate any longer was the potential that blacks would be moving into the county and attending the school. So that's what ultimately, when there was a petition to allow one black student to attend the school, that's what ultimately shuts the school down. Wow, wow, wow. Question over here, right here. I'm interested in the restoration. What a terrible shape it was in. And what about the wallpaper on top of the paint? How did that ever, how did they get that off? How did they make it whole again? And did they lose any part of the painting that they know of? So we probably have 75, 78% of the mural. Um, I'll tell you the first panels were conserved by a man named Paul Hanner at the St. Louis Art Museum. 
And then a woman in Dallas agreed to analyze the remaining parts of the mural. Her name's Helen Haupt. And ultimately, uh, she, is, she and a team of five other women spent four years working on the surface. And in the future, we'll do some other presentations. Uh, I brought one aid today. So, <laughs> and I'll, I'll, so Helen and her team realized there are areas of loss. And what they have to do is once it's been cleaned, that's a, a, an area that they have to fill with wax to bring it back up to the level of the paint. And then they do the end painting. Well, Helen was savvy enough to pull Joe Jones brushwork off of other parts of the mural. So these all have Joe Jones brushwork on it. So once the wax has been cured, they heat these up, lay them face down and put a weight on it, transfers his brush marks into the wax. So then when they go in and do the painting that, of the loss that you were asking about, it unifies the surface and you really cannot see a difference between her hand and Joe Jones' hands. It's pretty That's remarkable. Amazing. Conservationists are scientists, they're art historians, and they're artists, and they're amazing. <laughs> See, there are real jobs in the arts. I want people to stop saying that they're not. <laughs> and you're welcome to come up this and fondle these, these after because yeah. they're kind of fun. The next engineer who says that, ask the engineer to do that because they're the worst. Okay, next question over here, please. Was the college ever, uh, did it ever receive state funds? Does anybody? I'm guessing not, but maybe you can no. disabuse me of that notion. <laughs> that, I, don't I, think so. I, don't, I don't think so, no. Uh, Follow-up question. Was it uh, dependent solely on contributions uh, in student tuition to, to run itself? Well, I, mean, I mean, it was a work college. So the students worked, worked for their education, so. They did have patrons, though, that, that sent them money, yeah. mm -hmm. patrons from around the country. Mm -hmm. Okay, where's Nikolai? How are we doing? Okay, next question, then I can't find him. Oh, we have five more minutes. Okay, next question. Let's go ahead. <laughs> so I'm just trying to read these words on the sharecropper's wall. Okay, that's it. Okay, all right. Uh, we have a question right here. How Thank much you. did the restoration cost? Good question. Yeah. So uh, the restoration, uh, we got a grant for $530,000 from the ANCRC, and that was the restoration of the mural. St. Louis never gave us a prize for the section they restored. And Helen, with the blessings of Paul Hanna, reworked theirs so it was unified with the whole project. But mm -hmm. so over 500,000. Thank you. I think that would be the last question. And um, I, I want us to just think about perhaps with this mural, not overlook the fact that I think one message that's in it is all people suffer. When, when they are uh, molested by indifference and inequality. And one thing about this mural, it really forces us, if we think about it, it's not just we in, in the South to think about, it is, it is the African Americans who are held down. And if you're white, you can divorce yourself from that and say it was not we, it was they. Mm -hmm. uh, but Joe Jones is very careful to show the sufferings of everybody, right. of, of two very distinct groups of people and how they're connected. And I don't want us to miss either that we still kind of have that affect in our mind today of thinking we're so separated. Somebody else's suffering is not me. Mm -hmm. But I think it gets to this thing about being inextricably bound mm -hmm. to each other's fate. Whether or not we bother to see it or bother to own it, because this is the kind of thing that's held our South back and we have not recovered from it. I think that's one of the discussions this mural can, can start. Because if you were a miter in Arkansas, you weren't just a whole lot better off. I would say some, because if you had white skin, you know, that, that was an advantage. But you didn't have a lot going for you if you had to have that kind of hard work. And also, and think about the blacks who were the sharecroppers. And mm -hmm. just cross-pollinate those thoughts and think about what it means. And I, I just wanted to share with you a dream I have for this mural so that you can all start thinking about how you're gonna help the Arts Caucus do this. I, I, I think I, were, I told the Chancellor 
the fact that this mural is here and it is the centerpiece of everything. And I, I've talked with, uh, I think Victoria, I've forgotten from UCA, is Victoria here? I've talked about these, we have murals all across the state. Some of them are WPA, at the, po the post offices were public art places. Some of those still exist. Fort Smith does a phenomenal job with his murals. And so I'm thinking starting from here, we could create art and the economy, miles of murals. Uh -huh. Miles of murals where people come to our state, or we in our state, travel from one place, you know, you're on a trek. And everywhere there's a mural, somebody's going to have to eat, somebody's going to have to spend the night. It is economic development. And, I, and this is just one of the possibilities. But I, 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 I thank you all for being here, and will you please join me in giving our panelists a round of applause. And thank you. And, and now, probably what most of you have been waiting for, the, the reflection room is right over here where the mural, mural is, and I will bid you a good night to this part of this, and thank you once again, and keep, and stay tuned to all the great things that are gonna be happening in this space. Thank you, Chancellor, for being the person you are and having this vision. I really appreciate it. Good night, everybody. <laughs>